Three months ago, I began an experiment. I created a living forest inside a glass box and documented everything that happened. At first, my experiment was nothing but bare soil, but before long, it turned into chaos. Predators hunting, ant colonies waging war, nurseries blooming underground, and alien-looking creatures lurking and hunting inside the glass box. Let's rewind to the beginning of the experiment. The tank was built from dirt, a volcanic rock, and two Venus flytraps. They looked harmless then, but would soon become some of the fiercest hunters in this world. Then I introduced a queen ant along with her workers. She wasted no time. After a brief exploration, she began to dig, pushing her way down until she vanished underground. For weeks, I saw no signs of her. I thought she was gone. Little did I know, she was preparing for something that would change this entire world. In the center, I placed the skeleton of a Mosasaurus, stretched from head to tail. Then came the first storm. Rain fell on this tiny world, each drop hitting the ground like a drumbeat. The water made everything come alive. Green shoots began to rise, and with them came the first signs of life. I saw the first living things. Tiny worms wriggled through the soil, feeding the roots and stirring the earth. Isopods emerged from beneath the rock, cleaning up dead leaves and mold. They became the tank's janitors. Meanwhile, the flytraps were waking up. Their green jaws waited wide open for something bold enough to step inside. One ant got a little bit too close, stepping onto one of the traps. The jaws could close on him at any second. But the ant walked away unharmed. Venus flytraps have a very interesting system for how they detect prey and activate their jaws. Each trap has small hairs inside, called trigger hairs. If a bug touches one, nothing happens. But if an insect touches two of them within about 20 seconds, the jaw snaps shut. Just like flowers, they produce sweet liquid along the edges of the trap. It smells delicious to insects. And while they're busy sipping, the plant gets ready to strike. That's exactly what happened one morning when a curious ant wandered too close. It stepped inside and began to feed, but then... The trap snapped shut in an instant. Over the next few days, the plant will release digestive enzymes to break the insect down. And when it's done eating, it will reopen, ready to hunt again. Sometimes, I've seen an ant stand inside the trap for a full 30 seconds, drink the nectar, and start to walk away only for the trap to finally close just as it's leaving. I guess it didn't just hit enough trigger hairs until the very end. By day 15, the plants had grown thick and lush. A forest was taking shape, and there were different forms of life. The crickets took advantage feeding on fresh shoots and multiplying so quickly they threatened to overrun everything. They weren't just eating the plants anymore. They even began harassing the isopods. With no predators, their numbers spiraled out of control. So on day 16, I introduced a ghost mantis, an alien looking creature with a body twisted like a dead leaf and eyes that seemed to watch from another world. It moved in slow, deliberate motions, as if gravity didn't fully apply to it and every step felt like it was sizing up the entire tank. Within minutes, she climbed to the highest point in the tank and waited. It didn't stalk its prey. It let the prey stalk itself, creeping closer without ever knowing the danger. A fly hopped into range. In a split second, her spiked forearm shot forward, grabbing the insect in an iron grip. Even the ants seemed to give her space, sensing she was something different. And her appetite wasn't just for prey. Female mantises carry a darker legend. During mating, a female mantis sometimes eats the male's head. 
Even after losing its head, the male will continue to mate because the nerves in its abdomen control the body's movements, and the female goes on to eat the rest of the male. It isn't cruelty, it's survival. Making eggs takes a lot of energy, and the male's body is a big, high-protein meal. By eating him, she gets the food she needs to give her young the best chance to survive. But while predators clashed above ground, something else was stirring below. After weeks without a sign, I finally saw the queen. The colony was alive. Chambers had been carved. Eggs became larvae, then pupae. New workers had emerged, small at first, but ready to serve. What started as a small colony had become a restless army. The colony grew so fierce that even the worms weren't safe. The ants raided them, turning the writhing bodies into food for their growing numbers. To this colony, every other creature was either a threat or food. One cricket wandered near the nest entrance. The ants launched a direct attack, using their mandibles to clamp down and tear at the cricket's body until the limbs snapped. These ants sting using their abdomen, injecting venom that quickly paralyzes small prey. The sting also releases an alarm pheromone that attracts other ants to join the attack. The meal cricket stood no chance, and its only purpose now was to serve as food for my colony. Piece by piece, the ants cut it apart, legs and wings first, then the body, dragging every part underground. The colony was getting way too big for this small terrarium. I needed to stop them. It was time to introduce a new predator, a group of scorpions deadly and venomous. As you can see, they're super creepy. Each one has a stinger at the end, injecting venom like a living syringe. That's why when I opened the container to get a closer look, I got extremely scared when he started bolting right at me. One of them started running across the floor like he owned the place. Don't worry, I managed to scoop him back into the enclosure. But let's just say, I had second thoughts about putting him in at all. Anyway, I went and put the scorpions in the tank. Scorpions glow under ultraviolet light, which helps them identify each other and hide. These creatures have very poor vision. Instead, they sense the world through vibrations. Scorpions often prefer to stay buried in the soil, waiting in ambush where nothing can see them. But one day, this scorpion crawled out across the leaves and into the ghost mantis territory. The scorpion stood perfectly still the mantis walked straight toward it and nearly stepped over the motionless predator. For a long second, the mantis and the scorpion faced each other, two hunters sharing the same stage. This time, the mantis turned away, leaving both creatures unharmed. Then come the ants. One ant came wandering dangerously close to the scorpion. In a flash, the scorpion lunged, pincers snapping shut as its stinger curled to strike. But don't worry, this ant twisted free and escaped unharmed. When ants sense danger, they release alarm pheromones, a chemical signal that calls others to attack. That's exactly what happened moments later when the scorpion moved too close to the nest. Suddenly, a wave of ants rushed out, swarming over him. They latched on from every side, biting and pulling with relentless force. For the first time, the scorpion wasn't the hunter. It was the hunted. Luckily, the scorpion managed to break free and disappear into the bushes. One morning, I noticed something strange. I saw a black ant wandering across the terrarium floor, an ant that didn't belong to my colony. I wasn't sure what drew it in. Maybe the faint scent of a dead cricket left behind after a hunt? Maybe the moist soil and plants promising water and sugar? But when outsiders follow the scent, it never ends in peace. What began with a single scout quickly turned into an invasion. More black ants poured into the terrarium. When two colonies meet, they almost never merge. They go to war. And that's exactly what was happening here. The clash was brutal. 
Red and black ants locked together, mandibles tearing, stingers striking. I watched as some of my red ants were dragged away and killed. Even worse, a few of the black ants managed to slip past the fighting lines and force their way into the nest itself. The heart of the colony was at risk. That was the moment I decided to step in. To save my red colony from being overrun, I removed the black ants one by one, pulling them from the terrarium until the invasion finally stopped. The cost was high. Several red workers had already been lost, but the queen and the nest survived. When the war was over, my ants dragged the bodies of their fallen sisters to a corner of the terrarium, what scientists called a cemetery chamber, kept far from the queen and the food supply. It is where the colony stores its dead and waste to protect the nest against disease. The sky began to darken, and the animals hurried to hide. It could only mean one thing. It was about to rain. The ants were getting completely soaked. You see, ants are amazing due to the ability to work as a team. In the wild, when floods hit, they link their bodies together to form living rafts. The queen rides safely in the center, while the ants on the bottom take turns so nobody drowns. These floating colonies can drift for weeks until they reach dry land. And here, they did the same. The ants locked legs and jaws, fusing into a single living mass that floated above the waterline. They moved as one, calm, organized, unstoppable. The rain poured, the flood rose, but not a single ant was lost. Once the storm had passed, the animals returned to drink from the fresh pools of water left behind. For a time, everything worked. Predators hunted, plants climbed, nothing ruled alone. The scorpion disappeared for days at a time, only reappearing under the cover of night. He rarely needed to hunt, only once every few days. The mantis and scorpion learned to avoid each other's paths. And deep below, in the hidden heart of the colony, the queen laid more eggs. Her empire was spreading.